Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, marketplace number four uh, of sustainable earth. Uh, and uh, we have uh, four fantastic speakers here uh, presenting in two teams of two. Uh, so first, I would like to welcome uh, Amanda Burton, who is engineer and design research at the University of Plymouth, working on Indigo project, and her colleague uh, Jasper Gra uh, Graham Jones, who is an assistant professor at the same University of Plymouth. Uh, the book uh, is called Towards a Circular Economy of Fishing Year. Uh, I'm excited to hear it. Please welcome. Uh, so first okay. I would like to Hi, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I have a talk today about the circular economy for fishing gear. I work on the Indigo project, which aims to reduce plastic pollution in the Channel region, um, partly through uh, developing a new biodegradable material and also supporting and developing fishing gear recycling in order to shift the system towards a more circular economy for fishing gear. Um, so just want to introduce the team. I'm here um, on behalf of the Indigo team working at Plymouth. We also have nine other partners in the UK and France um, looking at the, the problem for the Channel region. Um, Dr. Graham Jones is with me on the call today and will be um, here for the Q&A. Um, we also work with Professor John Summerscales um, at the University of Plymouth, Rob Thompson from Odyssey Innovation and the Net Regeneration Project and Ben Bryant and Rudy and um, Garrity, um, who will make up the Plymouth team. So just starting with a more general look at the circular economy, I expect many of you are familiar with this, um, but this is really um, looking at the shift away from the historic linear models where we take, make and dispose which are no longer fit for purpose in a finite world with a growing population. So we're looking to create an economy where we design out waste, keep products in use for as long as possible and regenerate natural systems. And this is illustrated in this butterfly diagram developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which shows materials flowing around the system in loops where nothing goes to waste. So we use things rather than using them up. So there's the biological cycle of materials on the left and on the right, the cycle of technical materials such as metals and glass and plastics, um, where the goal is to really keep materials at their highest value for as long as possible. Um, so this is prioritizing these inner loops, it's lengthening the, um, the use phase and getting better at maintenance and uh, repair. Um, it's actually changing business models to uh, things like product as service. So the idea that we is we don't have to own everything we use. So you, you some car clubs and uh, buying lighting service rather than light bulbs, um, repair cafes, which allow us to keep things in use for longer. Um, and then when they're beyond repair, we look at designing them so that they can be dismantled into component parts, ready to replace or reuse elements where we can. Um, and then uh, developing technology to allow us to track and identify materials for easier recycling. So how does this relate to fishing gear? Well, firstly, what do we mean by fishing gear? This can be anything from an angler's line with a hook on the end um, to trawl nets, which are sometimes several kilometers long, um, weigh many tons and costing £100,000. And this is all fishing gear. It includes aquaculture gear like mussel bags, pots, traps, nets, and all the peripheral components. And the gear that's used depends very much on what species is being targeted, and it's tailored to both the vessel and the marine conditions. Plastics have replaced the more traditional bio-based materials of the past because they are so durable and versatile. Um, so the, the illustration here are examples of trawl nets and gill nets. Um, but we're now only too aware of the downsides of what that durability means when they escape to the marine environment. So if we look at a circular economy for plastics, put simply, it's where the vast majority of plastic will be circulated around the system and the amount leaking out to the environment and to landfill and uh, waste to energy is minimized and plastic production is decoupled from fossil-based sources. 
So last year, there was a major study called Breaking the Plastic Wave, which really revealed the true scale of the plastics crisis and made recommendations to stem the flow of plastics into the environment. Because under business as usual, taking into account the existing pledges at government level to reduce plastic pollution, we'd still be creating twice as much virgin plastic in 2040 as we do today. And the rate of plastics entering the ocean would be three times as high as today. Collectively, we dump one garbage truck into the sea every minute. And the quantity of plastics that to this, um, in this precious ecosystem that we all utterly depend on would be four times what there is today. So something really has to change. And in fact, this report urges that a lot of things have to happen, all simultaneously and all at scale. So the report identifies eight system interventions that can be applied, which would reduce 80% of the plastic pollution entering the oceans over the next 20 years. The upstream priority, so these are things that can be done before the use phase, um, are to eliminate and reduce plastics altogether. So it's, for example, using a bar of soap instead of a hand pump um, or watching Netflix rather than buying a DVD. Uh, the next strategy is substituting. So this is where bio-based and biodegradable materials can be used where appropriate. And then designing products that are easy to dismantle and, and, uh, and repair. Um, so down to um, scaling up collections. So unfortunately, we're phenomenally good in the Channel region with huge armies of volunteer groups who are scouring beaches, coastlines and seas for waste fugitive plastics. Um, but we also need to increase our recycling infrastructure. And finally, to dispose of the, these most difficult waste streams properly to reduce our exports, which we know from the news have, been, have, have even worse consequences than uh, the additional transportation of, of actually uh, moving them overseas uh, when they end up mismanaged. So that really offers a vision and a route towards moving a more, to a more circular plastics economy for all uh, right across the globe. Um, but where does the work being done on fishing gear circularity in the Channel region fit in? Um, so these solutions aren't exclusive to our region, but these are some of the things that the Indigo project are involved in. So developing the bio-based plastics um, to substitute for gill nets and for muscle bags, um, looking at um, designing for fail-safe, designing to extend product life, um, to scale up collection and the infrastructure for actually moving waste uh, waste fishing gear to a point where it can be generated into uh, new products and retained within the economy and developing the local capacity for that. Um, the problem isn't exclusive to the fishing industry. So this, although it's very difficult to know exactly what proportion of uh, plastics in the ocean are related to fishing gear, uh, we know that from um, the amount of plastic that's being produced, this is a graph of the demand by different polymer types and the different uses. And actually PA, uh, which is the use, use in gill nets, which is the majority um, of, uh, of static gear nets, PA and uh, polyethylene um, in other uses is a very small proportion. And, and uh, we have seen in the recent report that there's a large proportion coming from packaging waste as well. So it's really something that, um, that is not exclusive to the fishing industry and there are um, solutions that, that people are working from from lots of different angles. Um, so looking at the UK plastics um, roadmap, this is the vision for the plastic patch in the UK to deal with plastic waste and this involves a, a very large increase in uh, mechanical recycling and a reduction in, um, in export. Um, so for the uh, materials map, for the, looking at the circulation of, of fishing gear waste, um, we can consider a, the journey of a typical fishing net or a pot and see there are a number of pots for intervention. So there's better management at the end of the life of, of, of fishing gear. So uh, this is in improving port collection facilities, whether it's convenient and free for end of life gear and also plastics that have been recovered at sea to be brought back to the port and disposed of without cost to the fishing industry. 
Uh, we're looking at improving sorting and recovery of waste plastics from the cleanup operations and diverting as much as possible from landfill to retain that value in the material and develop local reprocessing capacity. Um, and there are more problems to solve. So there's design strategies which would cover a range of up upstream interventions um, to make it easier to circulate material, to disassemble products and to extend their life. And then as well as the polymers in the nets themselves, there's also the components like dolly ropes, which are sacrificial strands at the bottom of trawl nets and rubber bobbins, which help the net to, uh, to move over the seabed. But they create wear particles by design when they're in use. Um, they're there to protect the seabed, but can they, but they also shed micro particles. So can we develop design, design solutions um, to those problems? So you could say, should we stop using plastics altogether in the marine environment? Um, but we can see that there are a number of strategies which can help to eliminate or reduce the use of materials. Um, plastics are durable and versatile, and we want to retain that utility. Um, but we can look at alternative materials that mitigate the risks if they were lost at sea um, and to reduce the, the likelihood of them being lost in the first place. So the bio-based polymers being developed on the Indigo project would be designed with a useful lifespan, but then if they were to be lost at sea, um, they would degrade without toxicity um, in the seawater environment. From an engineering perspective, it's easy to design, it's possible to design fail-safe solutions. So you think about the, um, uh, the an oil refinery, which is designed to contain hazardous materials and that, that's done in a way that um, doesn't accept failure because of the high risks. And now that we know the consequences of the loss of, of fishing gear, um, we can start to um, develop de design solutions um, to ensure that failures don't happen. Um, so it all depends on the uh, criteria we apply when we design. So manufacturers of nets and their components, as well as the fishing industry, make design decisions. And that when we recognize the true cost of those failures of design, um, whether it's a string of parts that have been lost because they didn't have a tagging system on them, so they couldn't be recovered, or a barrel that may have been repurposed as a float but wasn't designed for that purpose and the handle has snapped off um, because of the harsh conditions that it's been applied in. These are sorts of things that we can understand and um, uh, uh, look at the data as to why these failures have occurred and then try and design better. Um, and there's obviously policy su support um, that's already coming in line, such as the extended producer responsibilities and the minimum recycled content, which will help to drive these changes. Um, so just to recap, really, with the circular economy, calls for a shift in mindset to think about how we design the products that are in use. And studies like ours can help identify those blockages and propose solutions. Um, and we know that consumers are also demanding, um, they're more aware of the issues of, of um, unsustainable fishing and the pull of the economic opportunity to develop the circular economy and, and retain the material value um, will all help to accelerate the shift towards a more circular economy for fishing gear. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Uh, this was a very, very informative uh, talk. Um, uh, do we uh, Okay. So we have the Q&A session right now because in a way I think maybe uh, subjects are quite close by. Uh, one uh, one question because you mentioned uh, uh, that loss of uh, loss of fishing gear is is a big problem. So uh, are there already any kind of technologies used? I think you briefly mentioned that there would be things attached that make say nets findable. Uh, I'm just aware of the uh, Plymouth Smart Sound initiative and the 5G network deployment in marine environments. Uh, do you think that has potential to uh, to change the situation and covering lost fishing gear? Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think tagging for me is is um, a really part, important part of the solution. I think um, there are technologies that are being developed now. There are systems which. Um, 
will be able to tag in certain circumstances, uh, mm -hmm. but quite often um, they use a GPS signal, uh, which mm -hmm. means it's, it's difficult to identify um, uh, gear that may have sunk to the bottom when it's lost. Um, there are many varied reasons for, for gear loss, but um, I think the, 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 that, that's the, the kind of direction of research that's happening at the moment. So uh, we need systems which are appropriate for a range of different reasons for loss. And we need um, solutions which are also cost effective because they need to be able to be deployed with, uh, you know, sort of even you know, small pots as well as the big, large, large uh, sort of troll nets and things like that. Yeah. And, and maybe that, that leads very nicely to another question, uh, because you mentioned as well uh, that sometimes the quads are designed, uh, uh, let's, let's put them not adequately, or kind of that, that uh, they can be used and repurposed in other scenarios, but should they have been designed appropriately? Is there any kind of mechanism to, to kind of uh, feed in this uh, uh, this used data uh, from the uh, from the trolls from the fishermen using these nets back into manufacturers who are designing them. Is there any kind of uh, study and specifically for designing fishing equipment? Uh, uh, I imagine uh, that would be quite a niche, but quite uh, uh, quite an important skill to skill set to understand how do you make uh, circular and reusable. Yeah, it's um, sorry, Jasper, you go. Yeah, and a net in itself is quite a technical piece of of engineering. Um, it's designed to catch a particular type of fish. Um, the issue with a lot of nets is they change shape and size over their use, and therefore you can actually have a situation where your your nets start becoming illegal, and uh, fishermen are trying to act are are working with trying to have nets that last as long as possible. Um, the issue is, is you don't want to uh, lose a fishing trip because you have to change your nets. Um, nets are extremely expensive. So it's, so it's not in the um, fishermen's of, they don't want nets to be changed every day. They want to be changed every year if that, but it, it does come down to um, the design, but that's an issue that we're working with on it again. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think there's there's a question coming in, uh, which is, uh, what is the biggest issue fishing gear can cause to species in the ocean? Um, tricky question, because it depends where you are in the world. Um, if you are um, prawn net, is 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 a is a classic one for um, damage of the seafloor, but it's actually you know it's we still want fish of that nature. We, people still buy the fish that tr a trawl net comes in on. Um, you can use static systems that are like tangle nets or gill nets, and they have less of a, a, an impact, but they can be, um, uh, they can actually entangle more seals and they can entangle more sort of, so you, it depends on where you, you are having the impact. Um, there's this process of, I think, um, putting the nets in the right location. I think that that is an option. Yeah, I mean, there's there's amazing, it's a mind blowing amount of data that comes back from uh, the the different species that have been entangled and um, harmed and maimed by by fishing gear, um, and the the data collection is not not only done um, on the local level by uh, the, a lot of the beach cleanup groups that are um, collecting data on that, but um, also there's a global ghost gear initiative, um, which has a kind of standardised reporting structure to to really um, to develop that data on what fishing gear is being lost and the impact that it's having. Um, but I think that there's no marine species. I don't think that that couldn't be harmed by fishing gear loss. So it's an important problem to solve. This. That, that durability that you need in the gear itself is, is what causes the problem when it's lost because it uh, can last for persist in the environment for a very long time. And uh, like Jasper says, you, you've got the entanglement issues when it's whole, but it also fragments into microparticles which are ingested. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a significant problem. 
Fishermen uh, themselves are working quite hard to get the nets out of the environment, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're keen to do that, and they're working towards that. Um, and it's you see fishermen come together with beach clean groups, um, mm -hmm. working with beach clean groups to try and make um, the environment actually better. Um, and you, you, we see this along the coast here, working really? together, and that that is a real solution to, to improving the issue. Yeah. And I think historically it's been more more of a problem. But when when we weren't so aware of what of, of uh, what the impact was going to be, um, mm -hmm. and historically um, it would cost money to dispose of end of life fishing gear. So that has changed now. Um, you know, there's been uh, legislation which means that ports have to provide free um, facilities for collecting up end of life nets. Um, so that's already had a significant um, improvement in the situation. And also okay. now the, that, that awareness and, and there's the net regeneration scheme in the UK where we're actually collecting up nets from um, a lot of harbours across the south and southwest and actually getting them back into the economy. So they, all of this end of life gear, um, which still has value in it, if it can be handled properly is uh, so that's, at the moment it's coming in through um, Exeter City Council and then there are specialist recyclers in Europe that deal with nylon nets um, and deal with trawl nets and create new products from them. So there's a whole range of products that are coming on the market made from fishing gear nets from underpants to kayaks and everything yeah. in between. So they're, they're actually, um, you know, so that, that that's driving that that system really that's helping the circular flows and improving um, the situation. It's great, just to see, it's great to see how these di different products are coming out and consumers themselves are driving that uh, and consumers of fish are driving for uh, the want for higher environmental standards with the fishing uh, and it's a process. It's good that we'll get this and we're trying to promote this um, this drive for change. Absolutely. Uh, just a quick note, we have just purchased our first batch of fish filaments uh, for our digital fabrication lab. So those are uh, Cornish recycled fishing nets into three printing filaments. I'm curious how, uh, how this, when this turned up and how the prints uh, come out. Uh, I think we have a couple more minutes before the next speaker, do we? So. Uh, I think, that, I think that, was the, that was a nylon. That was a nylon net. You, you, you yeah. got this nylon for your yes. Yeah, oh, that's it's, it's, net. Uh, and that's from a company uh, just down um, west of us, towards. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. I'd be very curious to, uh, to, to hear more about about those. Uh, Thank you so much, Amanda and Jasper. This was uh, massively insightful. Uh, the whole new world of fishing gear and its relevance uh, has opened up. So I'm uh, looking forward to, to learn more about it after. Uh, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So our uh, speakers are uh, Christopher Suckling from uh, PC, uh, City Council. Uh, uh, please welcome him. He's going to uh, tell the Prevent Plastic Pollution Project. He's going to be joined by uh, Sufi uh, Nungjua. Apology if my uh, uh, wedding was a little bit, uh, my presentation was a bit off, but uh, she's a, a research assistant at the University of Plymouth, uh, focusing on environmental psychology. So, uh, looking forward to uh, hear about the Preventing Plastic Pollution Project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to start the presentation. So my name's Chris Suckling um, and I work for Plymouth City Council. Um, and then I'll be passing over to Sophie from the university who will be uh, presenting the last part of our presentation. So we're gonna be talking today about the Preventing Plastic Pollution Project. So just a bit of information about the project. So the Preventing Plastic Pollution Project is an Interreg France Channel England funded project. Um, working across England and France with 18 organisations who are all es experts in their fields with um, a variety of research, um, education facilities and organisations. 
Um, the project seeks to understand and reduce the impacts of plastic pollution by looking at the sources of plastic from source to sea, identifying um, and target hotspots for plastic, and then works to embed behaviour change, implement solutions and alternatives. So we're looking at from where plastic is coming from all the way to how it ends up in the ocean, then how to remove it from the ocean and change behaviour around plastic. Um, our project started in January 2020 and will be running until March 2023-ish. Um, so our specific catchment is one of seven our, um, of the project and it's the Tamar catchment. So the Tamar catchment includes the Plymouth Sound and the Tamar estuaries going up um, all the way up to River Deer. And um, we are working in partnership with uh, Plymouth City Council, where I'm from, the University of Plymouth, um, where Sophie's from, the Environment Agency and West Country Rivers Trust as a partnership. Um, so the problem of plastic and why we're doing this big pro uh, project across the channel to address the issues. So um, oil, gas and coal are fossil fuel building blocks of plastic. So uh, through the production of plastic and also distribution and disposal of plastic, greenhouse gases are released, contributing to climate change. Um, plastics also contain to uh, toxic chemicals, which increase the chances of disease. And as um, Amanda and Jasper mentioned in their presentation, um, they have lots of um, impacts on animals um, in the marine environment, for example, ingestion, and also some could be large enough to cause entanglement. Um, some plastics, such as fish in line, um, can take up to 600 years to biodegrade, which is really, really important when you consider, I don't know, 600 years ago, we're finding artefacts from the reign of Henry V, Henry VI, you know, um, all that time ago, we're finding their artefacts in 600 years time, people will be finding our plastic bottles um, that have been disposed of in the ocean. So experts predict that by 2050, there'll be more plastic than fish in the world's ocean. So coming together, we're looking to work out ways to address these pro uh, problems. So I'm um, starting with the um, targets set out by Plymouth City Council. Uh, Plymouth City Council, our team consists of two of us, um, who is my manager, Liz Cole, and myself. Um, and we're working with a few other members of Plymouth City Council who are providing kind of expert advice and guidance and support. So what we're looking at, we're looking at understanding plastic pollution. So we um, we have uh, teamed up with West Country Rivers Trust and the University of Plymouth, and we're helping to create this uh, hotspot map, which essentially identifies the key areas where plastic pollution will be ending up in the ocean. This is a um, created on a GIS platform um, using different layers to identify the key areas where plastic could be entering the ocean. Um, and then our role is we're going out and um, sampling the plastic that we can find through litter picks and beach cleans um, with uh, volunteers to identify and kind of validate the, the, um, this hotspot map that we've created. We're then going on to removing plastic pollution. So we're running over 40 litter picks working with the Ocean Conservation Trust and National Marine Aquarium throughout 2021, um, which are also engagement events helping to actually remove the plastic that's um, littered around certain areas across Plymouth, um, but also to sample it and survey it and see what kind of plastics we're finding and trying to kind of, you know, engage people and change behaviour. We're also identifying and removing angling waste and old boats in hotspot sites. So we've recently teamed up, you can see a picture in the bottom corner, um, with the Catwater Harbour Commissioners and removed 15 tonnes of um, um, end-of-life boats from the uh, Catwater. We're also working with more associations, etc., to hopefully um, engage a bit about angling bins. We're um, going to conduct six dive cleans to remove um, end-of-life fishing gear um, from areas in and around Plymouth. We're also installing cigarette ballot um, bins, which are essentially bins which you, where you can put your cigarette butts in and vote. So hopefully it's a type of engagement um, on the Barbican or potentially in the city centre. And as I mentioned, we're going to be trialling six angling bins across Plymouth, working with um, angling groups and fishermen. We're also enabling transform, uh, transformative change. So we're working with um, Environment Plymouth to develop a plastic free charter for businesses, communities, tourism and leisure groups and schools. Um, the charter is also going to be based on the surface against sewage approach to um, reducing plastic, where we'll be getting different organisations to sign up to a charter to commit to reduce their use of plastic. 
um, look to ways to reuse and reduce their plastic and then how to effectively recycle um, their plastic at the end of use. Um, we're also going to be engaging with a lot of communities around this kind of work and hopefully getting some ambassadors. Um, we're also in the process of developing a plastic free events protocol, which is very exciting. And hopefully this protocol will be used by all Plymouth City Council events in the city. Um, but then also we'll hopefully be pushing it out across to all third party um, events in the city. We'll also be installing 250 yellow fish markers, which are essentially um, little signs which go on drains um, across the city to hopefully engage people in the fact that when they drop plastic, these drains connect directly to the ocean and therefore they are littering into the ocean. Sometimes people can feel removed from that kind of thing. Um, but the um, yellow fish markers will help raise awareness around that. We also are um, a partner on the Britain's Ocean City Plastics Task Force. So this task force is a really fantastic group of people um, consisting of um, different organisations, businesses, um, education and research sectors, community groups across the city, including everyone from um, our waste recycling plants to Southwest Water to the University of Plymouth um, and everyone in between. And we're a partnership who are looking at different ways our individual organisations can help reduce plastic and act as kind of, you know, a model example of the best way to tackle the problems of plastic pollution in the city. Um, as part of this task force, we're also going to be developing a central directory and website will hopefully act as a bit of a one stop shop for all um, plastic queries and um, best practice in the city. So it could uh, we again, it's 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 been developed as we speak, but it could be a map with um, areas to refill your bottles, where to sustainably get um, groceries, things like that. So it's it's a real range of different projects and activities. Um, and that's just Plymouth City Council. So I'm now going to pass over to Sophie, who's going to um, present around the University of Plymouth. Thanks very much, Chris. So, yes, my name is Sophie Noyua and I'm at the University of Plymouth. And this is the team that's working on the Preventing Plastic Pollution project. So we've got Professor Richard Thompson as the academic lead, as well as Dr. Kaylee Wiles as the academic lead in the School of Psychology. And we've got Deborah Cracknell as research fellow and Florence, as well as myself as research assistants in the project. And what we mainly focus on in this project is understanding plastic pollution and also enabling and guiding transformational change. So if you move on to the next slide, please. So as Chris already mentioned, the project aims at understanding plastic pollution. So what we're doing in practice or what Florence is doing more so in practice is uh, she's monitoring and compiling the extent and composition of both micro and um, macro plastic pollution in the Tamar catchment. And in this photo, she's sampling micro micro plastic particle um, particles with uh, colleagues from West Country Rivers Trust. I believe this is somewhere in, in Dartmoor, this photo. And again, as Chris mentioned, so this uh, this monitoring and compiling helps us identify accumulation hotspots for plastic and also helps us identify the key sources for waste and potential key points for intervention, because one of the main objectives of the project is to uh, then develop this transferable tool that can be used in other catchments as well to guide intervention efforts. And if you move on to the next slide, please. So I'm not sure if you can see this very clearly, but that's just to show you the process of, of the microplastics being uh, processed in the lab. So they're first sieved and they go into a digestion, uh, shaking water bath. After that, they're filtrated. And then um, the suspect microplastic particles are then looked at under a dissection microscope. So there you can potentially see, you know, its color, its shape. So you can you can um, sort of determine whether it's potentially plastic or something else. And further from there, they go on to this machine called FTIR, which essentially helps you identify whether it is a plastic particle or, a, or some, some sort of natural uh, particle. And if it is plastic, it will also tell you which, which type of polymer it is, which is quite, quite exciting. And if you move on to the next slide, 
Thank you. So what we also do, and this is actually in collaboration with Plymouth City Council, uh, we're looking at or evaluating the sustainability and suitability of physical interventions to remove litter uh, from, from waterways. So this, this one that we've been looking at, what Florence, my colleague, has been looking at more closely, is called the sea bin. So it's essentially a floating bin, which is fixed to pontoons. And it's constantly pumping water into itself and also, of course, floating litter. And I believe it can retain a few kilograms of plastic in a day. And it's it's designed to be used in uh, sheltered ports and marinas. So possibly those places where sort of manual, you know, human led efforts of cleaning up litter wouldn't be as, as safe and feasible. So, yeah, we're still establishing the feasibility of, of the sea bin. But, yeah, currently looking into that. And if you move on to the next slide, please. So in addition to all this exciting field and lab work, we're also providing guidance for transformative change. So this is this is scientific guidance uh, from, from the fields of environmental psychology, essentially. So we are currently um, conducting scoping reviews where we look at existing literature on behavioural interventions which are designed to reduce plastic consumption and pollution as well. So this could be interventions that are targeting reducing of uh, singles plastics, also interventions that aim at getting people to sort their waste correctly or to get people to uh, stop littering, for example. And for these scoping reviews, we're looking at each of the key sectors of interest. So we're looking at business and retail, tourism and leisure, schools and education, as well as communities. And we will be also including uh, unpublished or grey literature in these scoping reviews at a later time. And what we've also noticed uh, when, when we've looked at some of, some of the existing um, interventions out there is that rigorous evaluation of behaviour change is not always conducted. So this is, this is very important if we want to make any kind of conclusions about how effective a particular activity could be in terms of its potential to change behaviour. We do need to engage in this rigorous evaluation process, which uh, brings me to the next point which is the next slide so yes yeah, so we are evaluating or we are helping the partnership to evaluate transformative change so as part of this work we put together an evaluation framework to guide and support the design and of course evaluation of behavior change interventions across these key sectors and obviously these behavior change interventions can look very different depending on what um, what um, what sector it is which organization or institution it is within the project partnership so it could be, for example, education events with schools or community events such as litter picks and other engagement events. So in practice, what we've done is we've created surveys and other tools for evaluation, such as polls, to um, assess intervention success in terms of how effective they are in reducing plastic consumption or changing other behaviours that are relevant to plastic pollution. And obviously, we can't. it's not always realistic to assume that we will be changing behaviors to a to a measurable extent but at a minimum we can always aim at um, changing people's attitudes and we can also also measure this for example by using surveys so if you move on to the next slide please so yeah that's pretty much everything from us and if you wanted to know more about the Preventing Plastic Pollution project, please uh, go on to our website. So this site includes all sorts of activity packs, other resources. You'll also find information about upcoming events there. And for any further information about how Plymouth City Council are approaching the plastics issue, you can also check out their website. And if you want to know more about the work we are doing, the International Marine Litter Research Unit at the university, please get in touch. So I think that's that's it from us. So we are ready for for the Q and A. Thank you. Thank you. This is this fascinating. Really great to hear how much uh, city council and university do to uh, to address these these problems. And uh, also from the from previous uh, talks, there was uh, uh, in, it's great that you focus on both sides at uh, cleaning up what is already there understanding what is there as well as kind of understanding where it's coming from as the as the metaphor voice was uh, when the when the bathtub is overflowing you don't uh, you don't go on uh, more of the floor you you close the tap 
So uh, it's great to see that uh, they are going both ways. Uh, one thing that uh, particularly uh, got me interested because uh, I'm uh, as, as part of my role, I'm running some events uh, related to our labs. So that's uh, basically events protocol. Uh, how uh, I know I know that, that it's coming, but could you could you share some insights? What uh, what is it about? How kind of a couple key things? Uh, what what was it introducing? How did it look like? What what to expect when uh, we would run events plastic free? I'm sorry. Was that addressed at me? Sorry, I kind of I, my um, speaker broke oh, up. Then I couldn't hear you. <laughs> sorry, could you repeat I, that? I think I think it's yes, uh, Chris. I think it's it was your presentation, so it's probably more question for the uh, the plastic free events protocol. I'm very curious about. Uh, Oh, sure. Yeah. So what, what the protocol is going to hopefully look like is that um, it's going to um, it's going to involve all of the key categories that event organisers will be looking at. So, for example, things like procurement of their um, food and their um, equipment, the actual catering itself, um, you know, actions that a lot of people undertake at events. So, for example, things like um, gift bags and things like that. It's going to be looking at... Um, at recycling and waste disposal and how the waste is collected and it's also hopefully going to look a bit further than that it's going to be a bit more of a sustainability protocol so it's also eventually going to include things like um, energy usage and lighting and all things like that um, so it's going to cover a bit of everything and, and the I think the idea behind the protocol is that it's uh, hopefully once it's written and it's, and it's tested and proven that it works we'll be pushing it out and it will be a minimum requirement so it will be a case that the people who are hosting these events in the city will absolutely have to adhere to this this minimum requirement that they're being sustainable and that they're avoiding all single-use plastic that they can avoid um, and then thereafter hopefully it will also be best practice that some people will start to take it one step further and maybe push out to deposit return schemes you know where people can bring their own cups or um, hopefully once COVID's passed, they'll yeah bring their own cups or reusable cups, things like that. And um, hopefully, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be um, increasing the um, best practice in the city around events. Okay, brilliant. Looking forward to that being rolled out. Uh, so we have we have a question actually from one of the speakers uh, from Amanda from the previous session. She she wants to ask how easy is it to stop litter tree drain from getting into the ocean. Does it go through a system along the way? Um, so I can quickly, I'll, um, so our project, the Preventive Health Future project, part of the project actually is trialling um, different retention nets and different ways to um, address the actual drain system and ways to collect those plastics before it gets into the water. Um, mm -hmm. Primarily, I know uh, Queen's uh, Queen Anne University in um, London is trialing this as are a couple of our French partners. Um, Sophie, did you want to? You were going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say as well that we are we are currently not us specifically, but other partners in the project um, partnership are looking exactly into this issue and whether whether it would be. Um, uh, stormwater nets are they called stormwater nets I've just forgotten the word I think that's what it, yeah yeah that's it whether whether it would be a net or some sort of device I think this is something that's come up fairly recently some sort of device to be installed in um sort of the manholes where where the drains are to yeah so it's it's still kind of open what it is that we'll end up testing in the partnership but yeah I think to my to my understanding there are various approaches to this so yeah we'll hopefully be able to update everyone as we go on okay Ah, thank you. Uh, yeah, looking very much looking forward. Uh, so th those would be actual nets installed in the drains. Uh, uh, there's you heard about the fat bugs that, uh, that are sometimes built up in uh, in London drains uh, when uh, when oil is pumped down. So I can imagine that that kind of in the long term that's quite a design change to solve uh, how do you fish out the right stuff out of the drain uh well it functions as a drain still uh but the, uh okay here's another uh coming from uh from jasper graham jones uh who and what will you do the net and plastic you collect uh on six net dives are you trying to recycle them 
So, yes, we're definitely trying to recycle them. Um, we've actually been speaking to one of your partners, actually, um, Rob Thompson from Odyssey Innovations, around um, information around our angling bins and hopefully our dive cleans. But we we're in the very early stages of planning the dive cleans. We're planning to engage with the anglers first to identify the key areas that they find that their line snags and hopefully we can kind of it almost be a win-win. We'll help them with their angling and also help us remove the plastics because they will know where it is. Um, and once we've done that and it then procured obviously our divers and get everything set up, we'll then definitely be trying to look to um, recycle them. Um, otherwise, we're also something I didn't mention, but I can mention, we're also um, planning to um, create two waste sculptures in the city that are made entirely from uh, recycled plastic. So one of them, we're, we're getting there with the procurement's almost done. So it's, it shouldn't be long until that sculpture can start. But the second sculpture, we have spoken about potentially doing something with the nets and the angling line that we recover. Uh, yeah, and nothing like... Uh... Uh, with public culture to to get people's attention. So actually, with the, with the yellow fish stickers, uh, could you also maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, what 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 is exactly that? How it's going to look like? Or absolutely, uh, yeah, uh, sure. I was um. I think I've actually got one next to me, so that was um, convenient. Um, these are the yellow fish markers. They are uh, they essentially get stuck onto the drains or on top of the drains, and the idea behind them is that they they just raise awareness around the fact that the drain connects directly to the ocean in one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at potentially getting some artists involved to hopefully put, take it one step further and kind of, as well as having these kind of um, these, uh, essentially that they are plastic stickers, but they last for, they have a lifespan of 15 years and then they're removed. Um, mm -hmm. And then hopefully we're also having some more interesting artwork with graffiti or something exciting around the drain to hopefully draw people's attention to them so that, mm -hmm. that, that, that people know that they're there so that once the artwork's gone, it will be kind of, you know, it will be retained in there their minds i think okay that's yeah that's the whole dem behavior change that uh, mm. i guess not, we won't be able to address in the uh in the couple of minutes that uh i have left uh i want one actually uh i wanted to ask because uh it's tackling uh plastic pollution at large uh i once came across an opinion uh that effectively Plastics is almost like a free byproduct of the combustion driven mobility and energy production. So that as long as we keep powering our with petrol, diesel, and our factory coil with gas and coal, uh, we would be getting plastic virtually for free uh, as, as kind of as a byproduct of uh, of that infrastructure. So I was wondering while we're moving well uh, at towards renewable energies and towards uh, electric vehicles uh, hopefully there would be less of this byproduct and if the price of the this byproduct on the market increases uh, do you see that changing behavioral patterns uh, around plastic do you see kind of that being a, an incentive to, to treat it differently to approach it differently I think that's a very interesting point, something that I have not considered personally, that is, you know, it is, as you said, it is, plastic is a very affordable material and that's part of why it is so, uh, so, so popular. But that's maybe something that I'd say your average citizen might not be aware of at the moment. So there are, there are many, you know, various different sort of determinants to what you, to your behaviour, as in what you will do, will you buy less plastic or how much of it you buy, how, how you dispose of it. So I think awareness of you know, awareness of what it is doing to to the environment or to the economy on a larger scale, that is sometimes it's not the first thing that people think about. So it's more so about convenience. Also, what's out there? What can you buy? What can you get from your clothes shop, uh, from your um, the shop in the neighbourhood? Uh, also, yeah, just finances as well. If it's cheap, people tend to buy it. So there are lots of um, lots of contextual variables there that can, can really uh, determine how you behave and what you do with the plastic in the end. But yeah, yeah, potentially something that once it becomes let's say more uh, more of a you know a knowledge that most people will have about uh, how plastic is actually produced and again connecting people with that knowledge will be one of one of the uh, the challenges but yeah potentially in the future an uh, interesting thing to look into amazing 
Thank you so much, Suvi and Chris. Uh, this was a very fascinating talk. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Amanda and Jasper for uh, for the talk earlier, and thank you everyone attending. This was uh, absolutely fascinating and uh, exciting conversation. Bye now, everyone.